Today on the Full Story series, we're going to be looking at what happens at the end of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles timeline. That's right, eventually the story of the turtles needs to end, but what if there was only one turtle remaining? What if he was the last Ronin? This is the Comic Story and Channel. I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues, I break them down into a narrative format, giving you guys an audio drama where I tell you the story of what's happening. But we do cut out a lot of the B plots, we cut down on the panels, and this allows you to go out and buy the book yourself so you can add it to your collection. All alterations are to prevent copyright problems. Now let's get into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Last Ronin, a full story right here at Comic Story. The Ronin dips his head into the toxic sludge. You can hear the voice of his brother speaking nearby. The water is cold and toxic as hell and he can hear his brother stating that he'd be crazy to swim through it. Maybe. But no bridges or boats don't leave me with much of a choice. The Ronin states, steadying the weapons on his back. Stay behind if it bothers you that much. He snaps, wading through that brown water. Where you go, we go. You know that, his brothers tell him. And he swims across the icy toxins for a short time, making it to the island. Making it to the wall quickly, he throws a pair of shuriken. Taking out one of the cameras and a couple of crappy cameras and rusty barbed wire tell the Ronin that they are more worried about people escaping than trying to break in. He pulls free a grappling hook, pulling himself up and over the wall, leaping into the lights of the city within. And he moves through the alleyway, surprised at how crowded and bright the city truly is. And I thought the Lower East Side was crowded before, his brother whispers to him. Doesn't matter. The plan stays the same. I just need to get from here to there. He says, motioning with his side to the tower in the center of the city. His brothers question him, worrying how he's going to manage his little mission. And pointing out the security is going to be off the charts. You know the drill. Overdapt and overcome. The Ronin whispers, spying a motorcycle nearby. He steals that, riding through the streets of the city, not trying to be stealthy for a few minutes. He roars down the street until he reaches the base of the tower, discovering a group of trucks at the refueling station. Should have stole a glider, Snake Pliskin, or a catapult. Silent but deadly. His brothers joke as the Ronin takes in the number of security guards. The Ronin knows that he needs a diversion and revs the engine of the bike. Driving forward, he jams a stick of dynamite into the handlebars, leaping away. That bike hits the fuel truck, and the Ronin uses the explosion to launch himself into the air. He bounces and he flips from hover car to the wall, finally grabbing onto a ledge near a vent at the tower. Wow, that was graceful. His brothers joke as he pulls himself inside. Worked, didn't it? The Ronin growls, and they begin to make suggestions about hacking into the mainframe and sneaking past the guards, but the Ronin could smell it. He knows where they are. You can take the turtle out of the sewer, but you can't take the sewer out of the turtle. He jokes as he pulls himself through the cables to discover a manhole cover. What does that even mean? His brothers question, but the Ronin ignores it, popping the manhole and pulling himself in. An alarm begins to chime as the Ronin gets back onto the street. I don't remember a lot of manhole alarms back in the day, his brothers note. And the Ronin tells them to be quiet as he looks around. Behind him, a security ninja comes running forward, ordering him to halt and a second quickly joins it. The Ronin throws down a few smoke pellets, quickly vanishing into the haze, leaping into the shadows as the guards follow him. The Ronin leaps and attacks the robot, slamming into it with his fist and feet. The robot falls and the Ronin turns to leave. Halt! It commands as it struggles to its feet. The Ronin turns, pulling free his tanfa, rushing at it. He keeps smashing it, blocking its attacks even as it repeats for him to halt, and one final blow knocks its head clean off and the Ronin is shocked at what he sees. What the hell? He whispers, his brothers are looking on, shocked that the guard is a human mix of robot parts. What kind of sick freak does that to someone? They all ask. It's the reason I'm here. That's who. The Ronin snaps, and more guards arrive, and the Ronin quickly disappears into the shadows once more. He moves through the upper city, avoiding the guards as best as he can, killing them when he has to. They continue to chase him inside of the apartment building, and as he gets to the roof, he knocks off another one of the guards as he leaps away. Jumping down, he lands in front of a speeding train, flipping onto the train's roof, and then back flipping away. Landing on the top of a police car, he opens the door, knocking the guards out, and he reaches for the controls, but the car is stuck and flies in a straight line. He manages to leap away as the car explodes behind him. Smooth moves. You still can't fly 10 feet in a straight line. His brothers joke, whatever, shut up. He snaps, continuing to leap along the rooftops, getting closer and closer to his target. Inside of his tower, 
Oroko Hirodo stands in his office, his guards coming over the radio telling him that they have an intruder in the city. He nods, telling them to stream the intruder's capture and execution to the entire city. So the Ronin turtle continues to move across the rooftops, finding another way into the tower. But the guards are massing. Luckily, he is ninja. He leaps up, clinging to the bottom of one of the police cars, using it to make his way into the tower. Easy. There's military-grade equipment and hardcore foot soldiers everywhere. Yeah, and the entrance to the upper level is way on the other side of the platform. His brother's warned. The Ronin grabs another bike, riding it across the platform, knocking the foot soldiers away. He tosses that bike and making it blow up in front of them, knocking out the guard station. But the foot suddenly surround him and the Ronin has no choice. Leaping among them, he lashes out with foot, fists, and weapons, and the elite foot soldiers charge at him. The Ronin flips and he rolls, throwing knives at the robots, dropping it hard. He turns, glaring at the cameras that stare down at him. I know you're watching, Oroko Hirodo. And I know you're scared. I'm coming for you. You coward! He shouts, and in his office, Hiroto is shocked as he stares at the video feed. A mutant turtle? I want all available foot to the tower now! He shouts into the comms. The Ronin comes charging out of the hallway, attacking the rest of the foot soldiers as they turn to attack him, and slamming open another door, he finds two ninjas standing before him. Elite ninja, I must be getting close now, he thinks to himself. Drop your weapons and wait for extermination, the ninja orders. But the Ronin draws his katana, rushing forward metal meets metal as the Ronin quickly cuts through them with his blade. He blocks their attacks, cutting through their joints before attaching a bomb to one of their chests, kicking them out the window. Activate the Stockman tech! Oroko Hirodo orders from his office, the Ronin continuing to scale the tower. He enters another room when the mouser suddenly appears, chewing through the walls. Flying mousers with lasers? Fine! Localize the MP, the Ronin thinks, pulling free a small device. He draws his blade from the large mouser as it rushes at him, and he stabs it through the joint, but the robot is still moving too fast. The robot's momentum carries them through the window, and he plummets to the street below. Another window breaks his fall, and the Ronin continues, bouncing off the side of the building until he lands amongst the people below. Hirodo, come face me! The Ronin struggles, every bone in his body feels broken as he tries to stand, blood pouring out of his mouth as he continues to yell. The security droids, they come forward, they order the crowd to disperse, so the Ronin struggles up trying to escape into the alleyways of the city. Hey bag of bolts, dude you're looking for is not dead, took off that way, a young woman named Jones points out. As the foot began to move off, Jones tells her friends to keep watch and moves in the actual direction that the Ronin went. Holy hell, this guy's bleeding. She notes as she follows the trail of blood to the open to manhole cover. In his office, Oroko Hirodo is angered to hear that his soldiers allowed the turtle to escape. He is shocked that one of the mutants remains to challenge him, believing that he had wiped them all out years ago. He crosses the chamber to a cryopod, promising his mother that he would find the mutant and kill him, finishing what she was unable to years before. The Ronin continues to move forward in the sewers, blood leaking from his wounds, and he coughs, spitting blood into the muck as he stumbles. The end is close. He can feel it. Dude, you don't gotta. His brothers begin, but the Ronin tells them to be quiet. He pulls out their weapons, and one by one, he lays the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles' weapons in front of him, next to their masks, which he drapes over the hardware. And finally, Splinter's journal. He misses them all so much, and he bows over the display in front of him, before finally picking up his now broken katana. I'm sorry, father. I failed you. Please forgive me. He whispers as he points the tip of the blade against his stomach, but suddenly his cough, strength leaving his body as he falls to the floor. No, not like this, he gasps, blackness overtaking him. There's a beeping sound in the background as the Ronin opens up his eyes. His brothers stand before him, and they laugh, and they joke about how he got his butt kicked. He looks around, and they're back in the old lair. Thank God you're up, a voice calls out, and the Ronin turns to the voice. April? Is that you? He gasps, and April O'Neil stands before him, her face rather aged. I'm so relieved you're awake. You had me worried, mister. But who were you talking to, Michelangelo? She asks him. Alone, laying awake in her bed, April O'Neil begins to cry. Everything happened so fast back then. Her and Casey were setting up dinner to tell everyone the big news, that they're getting married. But that's when Raph came storming into the apartment, beaten and bloodied. 
She tried to ask what happened, but he just yelled that they were ambushed and began to throw all of the food that was set onto the nice clear table to the floor. A few seconds later, Michelangelo and Donatello came in with their own wounds, carrying Master Splinter. Master Splinter, he, he was in bad shape. Casey grabbed his bat and he and Raph got ready to go out looking for Leonardo, but thankfully, Leo managed to get back after letting the others get ahead. Master Splinter said that it was always a matter of time until the Oroku and the Hamato clans clashed. Kairi was trying to end it once and for all. It seemed like things might end up being okay, but Raph went back out onto the streets that night. In our current time period, April wakes up groaning, rolling out of bed, hardly able to keep herself up with the loss of an arm and a leg. She grabs her prosthetic arm off the nightstand, fitting it into the empty place where her arm used to be. But as she fits her leg, she fumbles and it rolls to the other side of the room. She sighs and then laughs, looking over to Casey's mask, asking, Hey Casey, little help here? Out in the kitchen, Michelangelo strikes a match, watching it burn out. And Leo tells him that it's hard to believe that April is still alive, huh? Hard to believe that anyone survived that. Michelangelo says, yeah, yeah, right. He strikes another match in an attempt to light the stove, stating that the last thing that he remembered was an explosion and then, well, he was pretty bad when he woke up. Couldn't remember anything for days. The others talk amongst themselves and soon it becomes too much for Michelangelo. As the kettle whistles, he just slams his hands down, telling them, It wasn't enough! It's never enough for you! Raf asks, Yeah? At least I wasn't the one who tried to off myself at the first whiff of a failure. Michelangelo grabs the kettle, throwing it, yelling, You are a stupid fool! You always made our entire lives about you! I fought every battle that you guys had. Even the idiotic ones that you started. And you still want to judge me? The mission at the tower was always going to be a one-way ticket. From the start. For our father. For our family. For our honor. But as Michelangelo calms down, his brothers are gone. They are nothing more than his conscience speaking to him, figments in his imagination as they have all passed. Michelangelo grabs the kettle, putting it down on the stove, setting down four cups, filling the teapot. He sighs, stating that he should have been dead from that fall, but here he is, still alive, still able to fight. He may have lost one battle, but the war goes on. They've all stolen so much from him, but no more. He will finish what they started, what Master Splinter raised them to do. The last Oroku must die. And that's when he begins to remember how things ended for Raph, when he went after Kairi head on. What truce they had had been broken, the Hamato and the Foot were at war and there was no turning back. Raphael took the fight to them, slaughtering everyone that his size could reach. He carved his way through all of the Foot soldiers, shouting for Kairi to come out and face him. And even as he was cut and stabbed, he didn't stop. There was so much blood, all Raf could see was red. As the last soldier fell, Kairi finally appeared. They fought, leaving mark after mark on each other's body. An opening here, a block there, and soon Kairi was as bloody as he was. Eventually, they fell into the water, both struggling to finish each other off. Kairi grabbed one of the kunai from Raphael's legs, and just as Raf stabbed her in the back, she stabbed him in the neck. The last bit of air left Raph's lips, and soon the waters also turned red. As Michelangelo reminisces with his brother's memories, April asks what the hell is he doing he should be resting. Mike says that he couldn't sleep, so he made some tea. Hopefully, that's okay. April laughs, of course, this was your kitchen way before we moved in. The tea's from when you lived here. Hopefully it's still good. But as April pours herself a cup, Michelangelo stares for a moment and April asks what? Looking at my arm? Well, I also have one just like it for a leg. Little souvenirs from the last time we saw each other, Michelangelo. We have some serious catching up to do, but not before we get some breakfast. None of that synthetic crap. Real breakfast with real eggs. Courtesy of the black market. Fresh batch too. Can't let Salmonella finish what Hiroto couldn't. Speaking of, word on the street is that Hiroto isn't too happy about his cage being rattled like that. Michelangelo says, yeah, he's still trying to process everything. The fall could have killed him back then, but instead, April flips the eggs. Look, I'm no Donatello, but it doesn't take a genius to see that your mutation has progressed over the years. You're bigger, stronger, and you're healing amazingly fast. Michelangelo rubs his head, stating that maybe not everything. It's all so fuzzy. Still don't even know how I got back into the lair. April tells him to hold that thought. Casey, breakfast. Michelangelo jolts up asking, 
Wait, is Casey alive too? And a young woman walks in and April says that she would like him to meet her daughter, Casey Marie Jones. Before Michelangelo could ask, Casey walks up smacking his hand. Yeah, we kind of already met. You were a lot less conscious and a lot more bloody. This also might sound weird, but I've heard a lot about the turtles for my entire life, and I never thought I'd actually meet one. You're supposed to be the funny one, right? After wolfing down her breakfast, Casey burps, stating that after two hours of kendo, that should hit the spot. Michelangelo laughs. Yeah, I almost forgot what a real meal tastes like. Casey tells him just not to expect anything fancy in Rock Bottom. Michelangelo asks, what is that? And April says that it's just a nickname. New York split into three districts now, the top, the middle, and the bottom. Rock Bottom's the old street level for people like them. Casey says, yeah, then there's the rest of them, the resistance. April begins to collect the plates, explaining that they'll tell him all about it after he gets some rest. Now get some clean sheets, huh? Casey jumps up, telling Michelangelo to come on. She wants to show him something. So they walk to the gym and Mike asks, Kendo, huh? And Casey tells him, yeah, been doing it since I was little, other stuff too. Hard not to when you kind of grow up in the middle of this. Really does blow my mind standing here with you. The stories that I've heard, the photos that I've seen, you were pretty much storybook heroes to me. I even tried to learn as much martial arts as I could on my own mostly. Spent a lot of time watching old training videos and lots of reading. Casey heads over to the table, pulling out a cloth, revealing the items that Michelangelo had laid out before passing out. He stares for a moment before telling her, thank you. She picks up Leo's old sword, stating that she saw who he was. She didn't want to leave anything behind, considering what he's about to do. She understands why, the honor behind it all, but don't worry, nothing was said to her mother. Michelangelo tells her thanks again, but Casey then grabs Master Splinter's book, stating that he can actually thank her by telling her more about this. Her Japanese isn't the greatest, but she understands enough to know that this is special, handwritten like a journal, right? It's like instructions for all kinds of martial arts styles, techniques, and important life lessons. Michelangelo tells her, yeah, something like that. But Casey then says that she has a question. Where has he been? He tells her that when things got bad, when it was too much to handle, he started walking into the mountains. A kid from the sewers of lower Manhattan straight into the wild. Bad idea. He collapsed. It could have been days, weeks, maybe longer, but he wasn't sure how long he laid there in the mountains. But his mutant body would not die. He started to hear voices telling him that his destiny was incomplete. That he couldn't leave just yet. And eventually it got warmer, and the mountains provided sustenance and solitude, allowing him to take time to look into his soul for answers. He's read and reread Father's book, looking for some kind of balance, maybe even some peace. He spent years alone thinking that this was where he was supposed to be, like a stupid reward or deserved punishment. But that's not the way of the world. The real world found him again and he almost let it take him. A group of people found him and at first he welcomed the pain. At least he felt something after all that time. He saw the looks on their faces, laughing, taking a life just to take a life, for fun, no honor, and that's when he got mad, really mad. He and his brothers were raised with respect and honor, trained from birth for redemption for their family. That was his destiny on the battlefield to the end. Father's book was the path to learn and master all forms of martial arts, to adapt to every challenge and every form of combat. He was the last of his clan, masterless, Ronin, and it was up to him to restore his family's honor. His training reached its end, and there would be no peace until he fulfilled that destiny. It was time to come home and face it, to complete his master's mission, to kill the last Oroku. Casey flips to the last page, reading no peace. What does that mean? And Mike quickly takes the book from her, stating that it means that he has some work to do. And Casey says, good, he'll need her help. As he sets the book down with the other items, he tells her that he appreciates the offer, but he won't be responsible for anyone else getting killed because of him. Casey says, well, too bad, because she wasn't asking. He wouldn't be standing if it wasn't for them. They got trouble coming and he stirred up the pot. So if he doesn't want help taking out Hiroto, then stand in line. Mike pauses for a moment and laughs, and Casey asks, what's so funny? And he tells her that he is just trying to decide if she's more like her dad or her mom. Meanwhile, April is in her room, opening up the closet holding an old safe. She turns the dial and opens the small metal door. And after reaching in, she takes out a small robotic head, one that looks like Fugonaut. The gathering of the masters of the Foot Clan set together. They held up a scroll swearing Oroko Hiroto in as the head of the Foot Clan. 
taking over from his mother, who took over from his grandfather, the one known as Shredder. Do you swear fealty to the Foot Clan to become the master that you were born to be? They question Oroko, and he bows before them, swearing his loyalty to the clan and all of those who serve under his most trusted generals. He draws his sword. With great honor and humility, I rise, he says, standing tall. It has been 10 years since his father was taken by the Hamato clan and his mother slipped into a coma. General Oyama, I am prepared to issue my first order as your new liege. Send a formal invitation to parlay with the Hamoto clan leadership, those here in Japan and to Master Splinter in New York. He says, looking down at his sword. This war has gone on too long and it is time to talk of peace, he says, sheathing his weapon. Now Oroko smiles as he looks down at his mother in her stasis pod, his scientists telling him that they are ready, and Oroko steps forward. I want this broadcast to every part of the city, no exceptions, he commands, stepping into the hollow projector, and his image is broadcast throughout the city. Citizens look up at the larger-than-life image of their emperor. Desonins of New York, my people, my city. For nearly two decades, I have kept you safe, allowed you to prosper at will, my will. I alone decide your fate, so hear me now. Heed what I have to say. There is a monster within our midst. People look up at the image, shocked by the words, as Hiroto explains that this monster came to the city to assassinate him, to destroy everything that he has built. Any crime against me is punishable by death. Tonight, until further notice, the entire city will be under martial law. He proclaims, and security robots begin to flood the streets as Hiroto orders everyone to return to their homes. And know this, anyone foolish enough to harbor this fugitive will not suffer the same fate. No, yours will be far worse. He finishes and the robots continue to push the people around, pulling them off the streets as they shoot tear gas and water jets. The rebels look on from an alleyway, knowing that they need to find Casey Jones. In their hidden base beneath the city, Mikey sits on his bed as the voices of his brothers fill his mind again. Gotta admit, Casey's pretty impressive. Book smart and street smart, Donnie points out, and Leo nods, but admits that she is crazy if she thinks that she can take out the new Shredder by herself. She's just a child, Mikey says, turning to his brothers, who he sees in the room with him, and they nod, pointing out that she is only 17 and already tangled with the Foot Clan. 16. Sound familiar? Mikey says, getting angry, and Donnie shakes his head, pointing out that they were trained their whole lives to fight the Foot, and Ralph chimes in that Casey is just a kid. And we were Splinter's kids, and Karai was Shredder's, and Hiroto hers. And here we are, back at square one, Mikey shouts. Someone comes into the room and Mikey grabs a sigh, turning on her, but Casey doesn't flinch. Easy, whoa. I'm just wondering if there's some sort of ninja thing that I should know about talking to yourself in the dark. She says with a smile and Mikey brushes off the moment, telling her that it takes more than being sneaky to be a ninja. But Casey merely tells Mikey, that April is waiting for him in the lab, and Casey tells him that she's heading topside to check in with her crew. When Mikey points out that he doesn't think it's a good idea, she just smiled. Funny, but I wasn't asking for permission, she says as she turns to leave. As Mikey joins April in her lab, Mikey stops short as he recognizes the fugitoid on her workbench. All that's left of him anyway, April points out as she crosses the room. Sorry, I was hoping to ease you back into everything, but things are about to get crazy around here, as she puts a hand on her friend's shoulder. I think it's time we get busy with all the catching up you keep talking about, April. Then, in the past, Fugitoid confirms that all of his systems check out and that Donnie is prepared to leave. He reminds the genius turtle that he'll have to charge the cloaking device on the aircraft when they're crossing the ocean, so that it'll be useful when they reach Japan. While Donnie runs over for one last minute prep, Master Splinter stands with Leo and Mikey. Remember, our strikers cannot appear to be in an aggressive stance while we're also engaged in peace talks with the Foot Clan in Japan. Splinter tells him. Do you think it's legit? Hiroto's parlay? Leo asks. Master Splinter has grown old, and he sighs, telling his sons that he believes that young Hiroto tires of the blood that has been shed throughout the years. Maybe the time has come at last to close the book on this feud. And with a few parting words, Splinter and Donatello board their aircraft and they lift off to the parlay, cloaking as they leave the city and the safety of their hidden base. As Stockman watches the craft leave, he leans over the radio. Ready, the strike team, he says with a smile, and the guards move along the perimeter, radioing in all their checks. Suddenly, three arrows slip through the night air, slamming into their chests. A foot moves silently through the shadows, taking the guards out. One is only wounded, though, and jumps up to sound the alarm. 
Idiots! Less than 30 seconds to compromise our entire mission! Stockman shouts as he throws his computer. General Lee, acquire the target and get the hell out of here! Inside the base, Leo leans over the command console, asking for a report from his soldier. The alarm came from the sewer entrance, sir. We've got foot soldiers coming at us from all angles, he warns. Leo quickly turns to his soldiers, ordering them to lock down all entrances and take defensive positions. Casey, what's your location? He asks in the radio, and Casey Jones radios in from the hangar, where he and Mikey have grabbed April and Honeycutt. We're getting ready to head your way with the rest of the tech crew, he says, and they begin to run through the base, with the walls and the ceiling beginning to explode as the foot blasts their way inside. Leo, are we going underground? Casey asks over the radio. Negative. Sewer levels have been breached. Pull back to the main compound and get as many as possible to the safe rooms. Leo orders. So Casey confirms, promising to back them up when they're done. Suddenly, the ceiling above Leo shatters and foot soldiers begin to descend upon him. He pulls out his katanas, ready for the fight. Casey, about that backup? Hurry. He snarls as he leaps into battle. Slashing through them, he makes his way through the base, leaving behind the bloody bodies of foot ninjas as he goes. Another of the doors exploding inward, revealing the robotic foot ninjas as they charge forward. Back in the base, Mikey pushes Honeycutt and April towards the safe rooms. This is Stockman's doing! He's found a way to track me! Honeycutt wails, and Leo fights further down the stairs, joining up with Casey Jones. You two, up the stairs! No one passes! He orders to his soldiers, and Mikey and the others are about to get to the safe room when another wall explodes, throwing him to the ground. As Leo surveys the new ninjas, he can't believe it. What are those things? They can't be human, he whispers, and Casey nods as he lowers his mask. Let's find out! He growls, pulling out a bat and a hockey stick, leaping down onto the robots, but the hockey stick cracks over a ninja's head, useless. In the safe room, one of the robots reaches for Honeycutt, but Mikey is there smashing the robot's head off with his nunchuck. Suddenly, the robot explodes, throwing them all away. In the command center, Stockman stands in anger. Send in the Mausers! All of them! He shouts, and the command truck opens and discharges hundreds of the small robots, and they begin to flood into the base. In his fight, Casey struggles to his feet, reaching for his weapons bag. Hockey's not your game? Let's try cricket! He gasps, but the robot turns, punching him hard enough to send him across the room. Casey struggles to his feet, picking up a fallen sledgehammer. Ah, just what the doctor ordered, he says with a smile. At the safe room door, Mikey continues to fight the robots, telling April to get Honeycut to the safe room while he holds off the enemy. Casey swings his hammer, taking the head off another robot, and he turns as they all begin to close in on him. Walking a few feet, he joins Leo, who still holds his blades at the ready. All right, Leonidas, what's the plan? He asks, and the two of them look up, seeing the seething cloud of Mausers floating towards them. Huh? That's something you don't see every day, Leo whispers, and he gets on the radio, ordering Mikey to get everyone to safety and get word to Donnie and Master Splinter while he and Casey hold off the foot. We'll follow behind as soon as we're done. Leo finishes as he looks at Casey. The swarm of robots continuing to draw closer as Mikey tries to argue. Do it, Mikey. We got this. Casey nods, saying over the radio. The two warriors leap into the fight with Casey slamming his hammer into another robot as he reminds Leo that it's his turn to buy pizza after the fight. But Honeycutt isn't listening. He is struggling forward. I know it's me you've come for, Stockman. I'll self-destruct before I let you hurt my friends or imprison me again, he shouts, and in his command van, Stockman nods. Very well. If I can't have you, no one will, he says, and the Mausers all begin to open up, their eyes glowing red. The entire base explodes into a ball of fire, and as the smoke clears, Casey's mask dangles from the rubble, and Leo's sword lays nearby. Now in the present day, Casey Marie runs out of the sewers, shocked at the destruction and the carnage that she sees topside. Her team calls out to her and she comes running. Martial law, full crackdown, they tell her and she nods, but tells them that they need to get word to the others, that she is working on something. Suddenly, a heavily armored troop carrier screeches to a stop nearby. Everyone underground, now, she shouts, but they're stopped by two other robo ninjas. Two of the gang move to fight the guards while the rest go over to a nearby fence. She tells her crew to split up, that they'll use the telecom lines to get the word out to the other resistance cells. Meet up in the lair in one hour. Meanwhile, stay underground and watch your backs, she tries to tell her crew. But as Casey Marie moves through the sewers, she gets lost in the twist and the turns. Knowing that she might not be able to make it to the meeting in time, she has no choice but to head back to the street level. As she comes out of the manhole cover, she sees another of the robo guards harassing a woman. Stand up and be identified, the guard orders. Foot bastard, identify this! She shouts as she leaps into the air, kicking the guard in the face, stunning it long enough so that she can order the woman to run. 
The guard rushes her and Casey blocks its attacks. She flips over it, slamming her foot into the visored face, dropping it. She rounds another corner to see more guards attacking citizens, and after she shouts for them to run, she tries to lead the guards away. She stops long enough to look up at the street signs, sighing as she sees that she is at the corner of Bleecker and Sullivan. Man, I really gotta get back to mom, she tells herself. Meanwhile, over at the lab, Mikey squirms as April draws more blood to study the mutagen's effect on Mikey's body. Just hurry. I hate needles, he tells her. He turns to the shell of Honeycutt, asking if their friend is even still there. And April nods, telling him that she thinks that he is. Reactivating him would be like blasting another here we are to our enemies, though. She explains to him as she is taking the vials of his blood. He looks back at his old friend, finally asking how she got away after the explosion. She explains that she woke up a week later in the hospital, missing an arm and a leg. Oh yeah, in surprise, I was pregnant. After she went through physical and mental therapy, she watched as Herodo and the Foot Clan began to take over New York. After she got out of the hospital, she took Casey, and she went to hide in the lair. How'd you get the Fugitoid's head? Mikey asks as April puts a band-aid on his arm. Some of Leo and Casey's strike team weren't killed in the battle, and they recovered it. You know, Casey Marie told me about the training that you did in Asia and Europe, but she didn't tell me how the hell you got all the way over here. April asks as she puts Mikey's blood in the machine. Mikey nods, explaining what happened next was kind of a fog. Believing that no one could have survived the explosion, he wandered down to the lair, hoping to get a hold of Donnie and Splinter. He was desperate to try and save them, so he stocked up on weapons and supplies and stowed away in a plane to go to Japan. If they were on their way to a peace treaty, they had to be there. I was hoping that I could catch them in time, I just didn't know what else to do. April nods, hugging her friend, telling him that none of this is his fault, but finally, she puts her hand on the Fugitoid. I think I know how to beat Hiroto she tells him. Suddenly, Casey speaks from the door of the lab. Then you need to tell us right now, Mom, because all hell is breaking loose up there. After April explains, Mikey leans against the wall. I get the concept, April, but it's a billion in one shot. He looks at her, explaining that there are too many variables as he repeats the idea that they need to take out Stockman in his fortress before they can take out Hiroto. And our only chance is to try and activate Honeycutt during the attack, and if he wakes up, maybe he'll help us knock out Baxter's tech. I'm sorry, but I can't buy into this, he says with a shake of his head. At least this is a better plan than the 100-year-old turtle trying to attack Hiroto directly, Casey shouts in anger. The two begin to argue, but April yells for them to stop, grabbing Mikey's arm, leading him out of the room. She leads him to the hangar, explaining that she has been studying Honeycutt for years and knows that he is in stasis. She believes that they know that Stockman is always looking for his signal. She punches the code into the keypad, leading Mikey inside, and he's shocked at the hardware that the Resistance has on hand. I've been prepping for a long time, getting ready for one last fight for our freedom that I knew was coming. I've been planning and I've been building. I think Donnie would approve, don't you? She asks as she leads him to a massive armored vehicle. Yeah, what is it? He asks, stunned. Just something to even our odds, April says. As the battle rages on on Roosevelt Island, Michelangelo gets behind cover, radioing to April, asking what is her position? Can she hear him? Damn it! I told you this was a bad idea! Casey tells him that she'll be here, but they gotta take out the tower guns now if her and the crew can. Michelangelo tells her no. They will find another way. Lay down suppression fire and wait for his signal. Drop smoke! Lots of smoke! He jumps over, charging in, and Casey tells the resistance, You heard him! Focus fire on the two gun towers! Let's see if we can take those bastards out from here! But up ahead, Mikey runs in, stating that this has gone too far. He's got to find a way in, or they're going to die on the damn beach. Such a stupid, stupid plan! At that moment, a giant mech steps out, telling Michelangelo to prepare to be eliminated, but Mikey carves Leo's broken sword into its chest, questioning if it's just as nasty on the inside. As the mech swings, grabbing him, it falls over on itself, pinning Mikey to the ground. As more robots come in, Casey kicks her way through, and Michelangelo states that he thought he told her to stay put. And she says that he did, and she didn't. He growls, going on about her terrible discipline, her excellent initiative. But don't do it again. And she laughs. <laughs> yes, Sensei. But before this battle, we go back just a little while. Casey was training, and one night Michelangelo started to watch as his brothers in his mind told him that it would be interesting to see what she can do in 10 years. Except they don't have 10 years. As she stops hitting the bag, Mikey chimes in, telling her, You're getting cardio, but other than that, that was about useless. She shouts that she has skills, and she's never had some ninja master showing her anything, and she still kicks butt across the city. So Mikey challenges her. Hit me. 
as hard as you can. I want to see if you're just a child pretending to be a warrior. She yells as she charges in and Mikey tells her, Good thing you screamed so I knew you were coming. She keeps attacking, but Mikey deflects it all and finally throws her to the ground, telling her not to get up. She's been warned. Of course, she doesn't listen and she goes back to attacking. But the longer that she goes, the slower that she swings. He tells her that she's burning all of her energy, running on fumes. She's very tired. He slams her into a wall, telling her, Please feel free to take this time to think about all the things you could have done differently. Fine, I give. And Mikey tells her that that's not the point. You don't want to just give up. Even the greatest warriors can't punch their way out of every confrontation. Sometimes it pays to be subtle, fluid, evasive, avoiding strikes rather than delivering them. Look, we might not know each other, but we're practically family and you need a teacher. You got skills, but a lot to learn. Too much to learn, but I might be willing to teach you. Just know it's my way or the highway, got it? She perks up. Really? You'd be like my real teacher? And Mikey corrects her. Sensei. And she hugs him. Right! A sensei! As Casey leaves to wash up, Mikey contemplates if it was the right decision when April tells him that Splinter would be very proud of him. Mikey looks back. Sorry, I didn't mean to overstep. And April tells him it's okay. In fact, speaking of Splinter, she needs to know what happened. What happened to Splinter? Mikey sighs. Your family. You deserve to know. When I arrived in Japan, I listened to the stories about the Hamada clan, and I found their village deep in the woods. Turned out the village was actually a compound, and one of the elders was there waiting for me. His name was Master Shintito, and I begged Shintito to tell me what happened to my father and my brother. Shintito didn't respond right away, and then said that there are people, creatures, teachers, warriors, heroes, and legends. Your father was all of these. They went to where the peace meeting was being held, but Splinter knew that something was off. He didn't fully trust this peace treaty. Turns out he was right, as it was an ambush by Hiroto. As the foot surrounded them, they fought back against the masses, but even with their combined skill, they were no match for the foot's sheer numbers. Hiroto gave the order to his archers to be ready, that he wished to end the rat's life himself, so Splinter ran towards him, throwing his sword. And as the archers let loose their arrows, Donatello shielded Splinter to the best of his ability. Even though Splinter's sword did land in the chest of Hiroto, he lived. And the Hamato archers then returned fire, but it was too late. Splinter and Donatello fell. And that was when Mikey learned that he was the last of his kind, a Ronin. That was when he decided the feud must end and that he would follow his father's journey, train and complete the mission that they were intended for from birth. April takes his hand, telling him that she's sorry, but understands what he must do. He's here now and that's what counts. The way that Casey has taken him in, it's amazing to watch. She never thought that Casey would connect with someone in such a way. Mikey asks if she's sure about that. Seems like their connection is by design. April's design. April asks, what is he talking about? And Mikey turns back asking, so when were you going to tell me that Casey has extra abilities? The way she moved, the way she fought, that was more than normal. When were you going to tell me? You didn't inject Casey, did you? April yells, of course not. I never would. I've run a thousand tests on Casey since she was born. I was looking for the origin. And as far as I could tell, there are trace amounts of mutagen DNA that was passed from both of her parents. Parents who happened to have a nearly lifelong exposure to it from the company they kept. Mikey realizes what this means. Wait, we contaminated her? Does she know? April tells him that she is aware that she is different, but she hasn't been told everything. Not yet, but soon. Back on Roosevelt Island, Mikey scales the Stockman's fortress walls, seeing the paratroopers coming in yelling, This was a stupid, stupid attack plan. Stupid! After cutting the turrets down, he tells the airborne troops to get down into the courtyard and take positions. But once they get back on the ground, he looks up to see hundreds, if not thousands, of Mausers flying in. Mikey readies himself, stating, It's a do or die time, April when there's a sudden rumble, and at that moment, April's armored truck plows through the fortress wall with Casey yelling, Look who I found! April pops out of the hatch. Sorry, I got stuck at the bottom of the river. Her armored truck releases an EMP shockwave that disables all of the Mausers. She then continues to drive into the compound, and she grabs Honeycutt's head, stating that they only have one shot at this, and runs towards the computer. She hooks him in, telling him, Professor, you've been in the dark too long. They're gonna kill us if you don't. But Stockman storms in asking, What are you doing? April tells him, saving the world. 
She punches him with her mechanical arm, but Stockman smacks her down, telling her he almost felt that. He reaches over for her device, grabbing the box, but that's when Honeycutt's head comes alive. You shall not pass! A massive electrical current shoots through Stockman's body, ripping him apart until there's nothing left of him. Then a nanobite swarm begins to take over the computer as April says, goodbye, Zayton Honeycutt. Thank you. The computers all begin to shut down, and Casey says that everything is powering off, and they did it. The city begins to take back its own streets. The foot patrolling the streets begin to power down, and the people run into battle against them. They have won. They have taken back the city. And back on the island, Mikey, Casey, and April sit around trying to decide what is next, and April tells them. They've won the battle, but not the war. The war is still to come. The attack on Baxter's compound was a success. Mikey and the others managed to deactivate the power supply to Hiroto's army and the majority of the city. This allowed the rebels to have the much needed victory that they needed in removing Hiroto from power. But even with one foot in the right direction, it came at a cost. Many of those fighting lost their lives. And as Mikey sits in his room, he tries to formulate his next move when the ghosts of his brothers tell him that this isn't the time to wait. He needs to continue pressing the attack. Raph tells him that he knew it. Mikey's not strong enough for this. Way to let them all down. And Mikey yells at all of the spirits of his brothers, telling them to just go to hell. If he could bring them back to life to kill Hiroto, he would. He knows what he needs to do. This ends tonight. He doesn't need them telling him what to do. It's worse now than when they were alive. Donnie tells him that that's low. We all did our part. And Mikey yells, I know you did, but I have to live with it every day and I've had enough. Leave me and never return. And just like that, Michelangelo was all alone again. He reached for Splinter's journal, beginning to write something in it, and once he was finished, he closed the book, setting it down. But stopping Baxter's power also had other effects, like stopping the water pumps that control the flow of water into the sewers where April and Casey live. Realizing this, Casey Marie rushes back home to try and find her mother when she notices Splinter's journal just sitting there all on its own. Knowing that isn't normal, Casey grabs the book, putting it away while calling out to April, asking if she's still there. April eventually calls back that she's down below trying to see if she can get the pumps working again, but years of neglect have really rusted them over. Casey helps April up asking what about Mikey, where is Michelangelo, and April pauses for a moment telling her that he left without saying a word. He didn't even say anything to her. Casey grabs her mask telling her, well, she can't leave him alone like that. They have to do what they can to fix the pumps and help Sensei. Meanwhile, over at Hiroto's tower, Mikey begins his climb by setting off a series of explosions, blocking the path for any of the foot soldiers that are making their way into the compound, leaving just him and whoever is in his way. No more robots to fight, no more Mausers, just humans with human reactions, a fair fight, well, almost. After slaughtering his way through most of the Foot Clan, Mikey steps up into one of the upper levels of the tower, calling out to Hiroto, shouting, SHOW YOURSELF! From the shadows, Hiroto asks, Which one are you again? Filthy monsters all look the same to me, dead or alive. Mikey steps forward, 16 years! It's been 16 years since you killed my family! And Hiroto asks, Has it? It's as they say, time flies when you're having fun. Mikey begins stepping up the stairs, telling him that the Oroku bloodline ends tonight. Him and his mother will die. In front of Mikey is a containment tube where Hiroto's mother lays. Hiroto tells him, In truth, I hated her. She left me as a child and never returned. I only kept her alive out of spite, lost and alone in her coffin. Hiroto punches through the glass, exposing her to the harmful air, and Mikey tells him, at least she had honor. Are you ready? Ready? Well, I didn't get dressed up for no reason. He launches himself at Mikey, knocking both himself and Mikey to the lower floor, but Mikey quickly realizes something about Hiroto's armor. It's made out of liquid metal, metal that is shifting and adjusting to his movements. 
But a few seconds later, the second set of Mikey's explosions go off and the two of them are thrown out of the tower. They begin to tumble down the side of the building, with Mikey grabbing a hold of Hiroto, positioning himself so that when they crash through the water tower, Hiroto is the one who takes the brunt of the force. And that's when Mikey sees it. As Hiroto gets up, there's a hole in the armor, and it begins to close on its own. Hiroto throws himself back into the fight, swiping at Mikey as Mikey returns with hits of his own. The only problem is that Mikey can only take so many without armor. So if Hiroto's armor has no weakness, he needs to create a weakness. He grabs a hold of one of the explosives from his satchel, slapping it onto Hiroto's hand, detonating it, blowing back some of the armor. Then using Raph's sigh, Mikey punches into his exposed hand, telling him, that's a little gift from my brother. Hiroto pulls it out, asking, is that your best? And he snaps it, yelling, I will break you. But then the final explosion that Mikey set up initially blows up, taking out the tower, with Hiroto visibly taken aback, stating, my fortress, impossible. With that brief moment of distraction, Mikey grabs one of the antennas off the roof, smacking him over the edge, following him down onto the street. His armor begins to shift and move, and Mikey stabs him in the gut with Leo's broken sword. And this one is for Leonardo. Hiroto shouts, groaning, slashing into Mikey's side, as Mikey grabs Donnie's staff, breaking it over Hiroto's head, telling him, Donatello sends his regards. But with his injury, Mikey knows that he needs to get some distance between the two of them. So he jumps into the sewers to give himself the time that he needs to bandage up the cut that he just received. A few moments later, Hiroto jumps down asking, Why am I not surprised that we are in the sewers of all places? Mikey grabs his nunchucks, bashing him in the head. But soon there's a rumble as a torrent of water rushes in, sweeping the two of them, launching them back into the city. Hiroto picks himself out of the mud. I can't be defeated! And Mikey tells himself that he knows. This whole thing was a one-way ticket. And I'm not taking the trip alone. He uses what strength he has left, beginning to punch Hiroto over and over in the face and the chest, weakening the armor. You will be broken and alone forever outside of the city that you tried to destroy. Forgotten. Forever. Hiroto tries to force the armor to heal itself by overcharging it. I am a god! I am a mortal! But soon the armor begins to short out, causing it to explode. And the two fall down to the mud, with several moments passing of nothing. And then Hiroto's lifeless body splashes up with a big gaping hole in his chest. Along the murky water, Mikey pulls himself out bloodied and broken. <laughs> Some god. But then, one of the sewer grates is kicked open and Casey Marie rushes out calling to Mikey. She hurries over stating that they did it, they fixed the pumps. She's sorry that she couldn't. No. Sensei. You can't leave me yet. I brought the journal. You were going to teach me. You promised. Mikey coughs. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was my duty. The destiny of my family. She yells that she is his family now. And Mikey tells her, yeah. You. Your mom. Always. My father's journal, I left it for you. It will teach you everything. But the last lesson, the most important of them all, the journal opens to the last page where Mikey wrote no peace, but he replaced it with a couple of key letters. Now it read no peace, spelt K-N-O-W. A few moments later, April hurries up, but as she gets out of the truck running over, she can already see that she is too late. She looks down and begins to cry. Goodbye, my sweet friend. As the world fades to black for Mikey, he suddenly sees a light. And the voices of his brothers, they tell him to hurry, to get up. It stopped raining and they're all going topside for fresh air. Raph hands him his gear and Mikey looks around. Wait. But before he could even finish, everyone runs out stating that the last one out gets to do dishes for a week. Mikey jumps out of bed and he gears up following his brothers as they climb and they swing through New York until they finally stop on a building overlooking the ocean. Raph pinches his nose. Phew, so much for fresh air. Smells like Mikey cut the cheese. But then a voice tells him, you know what they say, whoever smelt it dealt it. And Mikey turns calling out to Casey Jones. But then Splinter says that while he cannot speak of his son's flagellants, New York City indeed has its own unique odor. 
Mikey turns to his family, finally with his brothers, finally with his father, finally with his friends. It does. It smells like home. And with that, Last Ronin ends. But we do have a little bit of an epilogue as we cut back to Casey Marie and her mother April. And we discover that Casey is raising her own turtle friends as the saga of the turtles must continue. And there you have it, the conclusion to The Last Ronin right here at Comic Story. And now if you want to find out how we got to here, well, we're going to be covering the turtle storylines once again right here at Comic Story. And so make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, because if all goes according to plan, weekly you will get new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles storylines. Thank you and see you next time.